what we would call breaking the law, undermining the rule of law, and undermining the constitution of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, we will focus on that this morning. Um, this morning, in addition to myself, I have the great pleasure of being accompanied in this press conference this morning by my colleague, the Member of Parliament for St. Augustine and uh, Deputy Chair, Matt Chairperson of the United National Congress and uh, Shadow with responsibility for the Ministry of Local Government within the Shadow Cabinet of the United National Congress. My colleague, uh, the MP Kajira Amin, and this morning, without further ado, I will turn over the proceedings to her to have the floor. MP Amin. Thank you, MP. <clears throat> Good morning to Trinidad and Tobago, our listeners and viewers, as well as members of the media who are tuning in in person as well as virtually. We are very concerned at this time as we get closer to local government elections that the government is getting more and more bold faced with using state resources to campaign. After depriving many communities of resources, road patching, um, <clears throat> infrastructural work, uh, drainage and irrigation, we now see a, a, a lot of projects going out and we are questioning that those projects are being done in areas where the PNM clearly feel that they are under threat. What we are also seeing in areas where the UNC have been making inroads, the PNM seems to be on the back foot. There is now a rush to distribute food cards and hampers and other social grants that come from state resources. Some of these people indicated that they never asked for a food card, they were offered one with a direct request to vote for the PNM uh, from receiving that. Some persons also indicate that for as many as four years, they have been running up and down, trying to get a food card, trying to get these social grants, trying to get these home repair grants for their families who are in dire need. And they have been given all sorts of runaround or have been told that those grants were not approved and now they are suddenly being called and given these grants. So we see that while the PNM has been starving the country of resources, starving families who are in need, they are now suddenly using state resources for their own political need. And we condemn that strongly and we urge the population to remember that state resources is taxpayers' dollars. Do not feel obligated, pressured, or bribed into voting for the PNM who has starved you of these resources in the past, who are now suddenly bringing it to you as an election bribe. It is a bribe and we condemn it in the highest order. We also want to have a little more transparency at the regional corporations, where in the absence of councils, CEOs and chairpersons or mayors will continue to run the regional corporations. We are seeing corporations led by PNM boasting of additional resources being given to those corporations. In particular, we saw Mr. Mr. Junior Regrello, who is the mayor of San Fernando, a corporation that the PNM is likely to lose, rushing to do a number of projects and expressing his thanks to the Member of Parliament for San Fernando West for providing additional resources. And we are asking where did those additional resources come from? Why only San Fernando? And why have you not provided the resources that you promised in the budget to all regional corporations so they can do the work of the people? In the absence of elected councils, CEOs must not be alone to themselves. Mayors and chairmen must be a guard in the interest of the public and not be using the resources of the regional corporations for political campaign. Any major decisions to be made at the regional corporation, particularly financial decisions um, concerning employment and so on, anything that requires a council's approval should wait until the councils are elected and installed. installed. And that includes um, major financial decisions as well as decisions about employment. You must have transparency. It has come to our attention 
And at Sandy Grand Regional Corporation, there's a proposal to hire over 60 workers. While this is something that our council, our UMC council, has been lobbying for for the past four, three to four years, we insist that it must be done with transparency. There is a requirement for a tripartite approach in hiring and doing employment at regional corporations where the representative union, the majority recognized union, the administration and the council must be involved in hiring. Having the council involved in that process ensures that there is representative from the elected member on behalf of the people. So we are today happy, happy for the opportunities at Sandy Grande Regional Corporation. Uh, but we are very critical of the timing and we are questioning who will make the input into who will be hired and we are saying that the right thing to do is to wait until there is a duly elected council which will form part of that tripartite discussion in terms of who is to be hired. And we are warning against the use of hiring persons in regional corporations or anywhere else at a time when you when we see the PNM blatantly using state resources to influence voters. We are very confident that the UNC will retain the Sandy Grande Regional Corporation and in fact may also win additional seats. In the San Fernando City, we also have the PNM on the back foot where the PNM is in control of the uh, city at this time. However, a number of areas may just switch hands. So people on the, on the ground are really fed up of the PNM. They are fed up of the non-performance. They are fed up of the crime. They are fed up of the excuses. And as we see more and more people gravitate to the UNC, was this campaign for local government election heats up. We are seeing the PNM intensifying the use of state resources as well as their mama guy. The PNM has been mama guying this population with local government reform since 2015. We are now in 2023. We had a general election in 2015 where they promised local government reform. We had a local election in 2016 where again they traversed the entire country promising reform. Nothing happened. In 2019, we had another local government elections. Again, they went throughout the country, spent a lot of money on the pretext of doing consultations in each regional corporation, which really was a big meeting, a town hall type meeting. Nobody was given any sort of draft white paper, any opportunity to comment directly on the proposed law. And again, we saw that fade into the background. We, in 2021, we were supposed to have a local government election, and that is when the PNM brought the local government reform to the parliament. And it seems that it's every time the local government election is due, they bring up the topic of local government and local government reform. That is the only time they seem to know that local government exists. Well, they did come to the parliament after many years, more than 10 years, of promising local government. They came to the parliament with a complicated piece of legislation that was also badly drafted and which included property tax. The law that they introduced will really make things more bureaucratic. And they are all over the country parroting over and over why regional corporations must um, agree to property tax. They have been telling the population, line number one, that regional corporations will retain property tax. Let me tell you, if you look at the, you know, they say the devil is in the details. The proposal is that regional corporations will retain residential property tax, not agricultural, commercial, and industrial tax. This means that if you plant on agricultural land, if you have a parlor or small business at your home, it is considered commercial. Any industrial manufacturing or processing um, operation that operates in a building will be taxed as industrial. And they give the impression that regional corporations will be collecting all those taxes. That is not true. It is only the residential tax that is proposed to go to the regional corporations. 
We see this as widening the gap. When we speak about the inequity in terms of what regional corporations stand to gain. The gap will be widened because based on this regime, there will be an inequity in the collection of taxes. Regional corporations with high density, high popu residential populations will obviously collect more taxes than those in areas with mixture of residential and agricultural, particularly rural areas or where you have a lot of industrial or commercial land, these corporations will have less residential populations. So for example, in Point Lisas, the industrial estate falls under the Kuva Tabaki Regional Corporation. And in these areas, the residential taxes, which are collected from the other areas, will be used to fix roads and, and infrastructure and so on within the region but the taxes from the industrial estates will go to central government, not to the regional corporation. So the regional corporation in Kuva will not be collecting those taxes. If you consider a population, a uh, region like Tunapuna Piaco that has the highest density population in the, in the country, that corporation will benefit from receiving higher amounts of residential taxes. You have you can compare a region like Sao Labantil region, for instance, which is just on the outskirts of the city of Port of Spain, which will obviously collect far more taxes because you have a higher density of residential properties and a larger geographic region than, say, for instance, Mayaro Rio Claro Regional Corporation, which has a, is a much more spread out area, less in terms of density, but they also have vast areas of agricultural land. And so agriculture taxes does not go to the regional corporation. They have far fewer residential properties and so they will collect less tax. If you look at Sandy Grandi region, Sandy Grandi has been named as the corporation with the lowest income per capita. The values of the properties in that region are of significantly lower than in other parts of the country. So you will have poorer regions um, collecting far less property tax than areas with higher density residential properties and you know more middle class and so on properties with higher value. So we must consider that this regime that is proposed will really widen the gap and give more to the corporations that are poorer than the corporations that have properties with higher value, higher property values. So we are warning against that, um, that regime and I want to make it abundantly clear that the UNC is against property tax at this time. We believe in diversifying the economy. The UNC was able to build schools, hospitals, roads, created over 50,000 new jobs without a single new tax. And what we have seen over the past three years from the PNM, at both at the regional corporation and at the central government level, is a suppression of, ref of funding where corporations would have been issued funds in the budget, but over the, the financial year, those funds are not being released. And you are holding the population to ransom. And I am calling out the PNM this morning. I am calling out Dr. Rowley this morning. You have been suppressing funds from regional corporations in a way to prove to this country that we need property tax. And that is a lie. You have been withholding resources, undermining regional corporations, and failing to provide monies for them to purchase material, equipment, diesel for their vehicles, to, cut, to be able to cut parks and recreation grounds, to be able to do simple things like road patching. And then you come to the population to tell them every time they drop in a pothole that that is a reason to implement property tax. And you are using this as a way of undermining the regional corporations to prove your government's theory that Trinidad and Tobago needs property tax. We are questioning your use of taxpayers' dollars at this time and we are not in support of property tax. I want to warn this population 
that while the PNM continues to talk about reform, they have done nothing, no, absolutely nothing, to implement local government reform. I will use the example of the Procurement Act. The procurement legislation was brought by the People's Partnership Government led by Kamla Pasar Isessa. For eight years, the PNM failed to implement the procurement legislation. In fact, there are a number of administrative measures that must be put in place. There is need for uh, the procurement regulator and the procurement board and so on. But in every state agency, you must have a procurement officer. You must have a registry of contractors who are registered to be hired by any state agency, any government agency, any government ministry. This, the registry has been just laying around. Regional corporations were never provided with a procurement officer, a procurement unit, or the uh, technology to begin to register persons on the national registry. Now that the procurement legislation has been proclaimed, the regional corporations have been forced by this government to appoint CEOs or another public servant to act as their procurement officer. They do not have procurement units and they have development programs and other contracts to be issued. And these contracts must be in accordance with law issued to contractors who are registered on the registry. Because those thousands of contractors and regional corporations did not have the opportunity or did not have the facility at regional corporations to properly register, the list of contractors have now been reduced. So many small and medium community-based contractors are now excluded and bigger contractors are now getting work. Friends and financiers of the PNM. And by shutting out the smaller contractors, it means shutting out those people in the community who would have had jobs because of the regional corporations. Even it, is, it applies to people who are doing contractors doing road paving, infrastructural work such as bridges and, and drains, but it also applies to uh, services such as janitorial services, um, caterers, and as people provide stationery and so on. So you have now put the regional corporations in a bind. And this is one example of an administrative measure that should have been put in place. And while the PNM is boasting about procurement legislation, we see where they are failing in making it a reality. The same has happened, similar is happening with the local government reform. While the PNM brought the local government reform bill to the parliament, it was passed, and the only portion of that act that the PNM felt it fit to proclaim was the section changing the term of councillors from three years to four years, essentially in order for them to postpone the local government elections. They know that the population is not happy with them, and so they wanted to postpone the elections. But did they declare any other part? Did they proclaim any other part of that act? The answer is no. Have they put anything in place in the regional corporations to make this act a reality? The answer is no. At the time when the Attorney General at that time, so a former Attorney General who was Minister of Local Government at the time, Faris Alwari, made the announcement of the government extending the term of councillors by declaring that section of the act that um, changed the term from three years to four years. At that time, the minister indicated that a schedule will be provided to the regional corporation so they will know in what order they are going to proclaim certain sections of the act and they can put things in place in the regional corporation, certain units and the administrative measures to support parts of the act must be put in place before. Up to now, no schedule has been presented. Up to now, nothing has been added to the regional corporations in terms of additional staffing, training, additional resources, um, and even accommodation to provide for what is expected in the reform. So this reform is Mama Guy. The PNM are up and down this country uh, on, plan on a platform of reform, 
that is a lie they have been telling the population since 2015. They have been talking about reform in 2016 local government election in 2019 and they are again on a platform in 2023. While people are starving, while our roads are deteriorating, while crime is on the increase, while regional corporations have been starved of the resources to adequately pick up, collect garbage in their region, to provide uh, opportunities for local economic development, to maintain their facilities, and to do the basic things that regional corporations are supposed to do. We in the UNC believe in devolution of power, we believe in providing support to regional corporations to do the work that they are, they are to do, but we also believe that regional corporations and local government, as the arm of government closest to the people, is best poised for delivery of all uh, projects so that our government ministries, when we were in government, often partnered with regional corporations to deliver on infrastructural projects as well as social projects. So in terms of education, in terms of development, in terms of local economic development, those are things that we see an important partnership between the central government and local government uh, bodies. We, have, we don't just talk local government, we believe in people-centered governance, and so even with the current legislation, the People's Partnership and the UNC was able to deliver in local government. I see that the Prime Minister is now accusing the UNC of instructing their councillors to um, deprive regions or deprive their districts of, of, in, of work. So in the essence, you are failing to pave the potholes to make the PNM look bad. Listen, eh? The UNC does not have to do anything to make the PNM look bad. They are doing it all by themselves. They have failed to do what is required. They have failed to pave roads and therefore you have potholes. They have failed to do drainage and infrastructure work and so we have collapse, landslips and flooding. And the UNC does not have to do anything to make the PNM look bad. But I can tell you, in fact, maybe the UNC has been shielding the population from seeing the true wrath of the PNM. Because in many, many areas, councillors put their hands in their pockets and take money out to purchase material to patch roads. They throw fundraisers, barbecue, cake sale, um, boat ride, all these things to raise funds to do community projects. And we have instances of that in every region where our councillors and even shadow councillors have been showing up the PNM because we have been doing work without the government assistance, without taxpayers' dollars. And that is for performance for you. We will continue to stand with you, and we ask you, Trinidad and Tobago, to stand your ground. Do not be intimidated by the PNM. Do not be bullied. Do not be bribed by the use of state resources to mamaga you in this local election. We have seen the PNM abuse even the areas that are their strongholds. And we ask you to say no against it. Stand up to them. Stand your ground and vote on the 14th of August to get rid of the PM. We stand in defense of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I thank you for this opportunity to share. And I now hand over to my colleague, MP Rudy Indarsi. Thank you very much, MP Amin. And uh, this morning, I really want to endorse all that you have said as it relates to the current status of local government and what is being bandied about by Dr. Rowley and the People's National Movement as local government reform in the run-up to the local government elections scheduled for the 14th of August. It is nothing, it is shameless, it is disgraceful for them to speak of local government reform when they cannot speak about anything that they have achieved in local government for the last eight years. In fact, all they are looking to do is to get a mandate to impose property tax and continue to impoverish the ordinary citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. And you are quite right. They are breaking the law, the collective agreement 
as it relates to the contemplated employment of 60 odd persons in the per permanent establishment at the San Grande Regional Corporation. It is food cards, it is employment within the unemployment relief program and roads and bridges and landscapes and cylinder crossings and recreation grounds and pavilions and so on have collapsed in fact from the point of view of the Kuba Tabaki Talpara Regional Corporation. The worst roads in Trinidad and Tobago exist in the constituency of Kuba South, whether it is the Bukaro Road, the Camden Road, and uh, the road uh, that leads to the Phoenix Park Industrial Estate, the Port of Point Lisas, and so on. And uh, I am forced to even join you to ask the question, where is the Secondary Roads Rehabilitation and Improvement Company Limited? Under Rohan Sinanan, it seems to be votes for roads, and they are paving roads left, right, and center in PNM control constituencies. Rohan Sinanan, tell us how much of the $400 million that have been allocated to you for this financial year under this special purpose company, how much have been spent in areas controlled by the opposition in the context of road rehabilitation and so on. I leave it at that and uh, I move on to some of the issues that I want to focus on here this morning, namely the creation of the special vetted units within the police service of Trinidad and Tobago, the appointment of former cabinet minister, Mr. Darrell Smith, as what we would call a trade facilitation officer by the government of Trinidad and Tobago, and also the $15 million bill and counting as it relates to the Paria Commission of Inquiry. And before I go there, I want to tell you that to inform you that tomorrow the United National Congress and the National Transformation for um, National Transformation Alliance and the ILP will be holding a joint platform meeting as it relates to the local government campaign at the center of excellence because media reports have confirmed that Mr. Jack Warner has emerged at this time as lending his support to the UNC ahead of the upcoming local government elections and my colleague in her capacity can attest to that because he held a meeting jointly with her and the activists recently at the Tunapuna Regional Office of the UNC where they addressed activists and party supporters in the context of the upcoming campaign. This is a major development in the political landscape of Trinidad and Tobago in the context of Mrs. Passat Bissessa joining forces with uh, collaborating with Mr. Gary Griffith and uh, Mr. Warner on behalf of their respective uh, political interests to create a common platform for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. While we see political wabins and sardines and joshuas and so on swimming around trying to bite uh, every bait that they get, we can see political kingfishes and barracudas and so on joining with the United National Congress to stand their ground against the People's National Movement. And we invite everyone to join this meeting tomorrow to see and hear about this milestone political development and what it means for Trinidad and Tobago. And you see, distinguished ladies and gentlemen who are looking on this morning, I want to point you because this is a government which continues to break the laws of this country. They continue to undermine the rule of law and they continue to undermine the constitution of Trinidad and Tobago because I have a copy in my hand here of the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago. And section 123A, one says, subject to the section, to section 123, one, the commissioner of police 
shall have the complete power. The commissioner of police shall have the complete power to manage the police service and is required to ensure that the human, financial, and material resources available to the service are used in an efficient and in an effective manner. And two, of the commissioner of police shall have the power to A, appoint persons to hold or act in the office of the police service other than an officer referred to in section 1.31A, that is at the rank of um, police commissioner and deputy police commissioners and so on, including the power to make appointments on promotion and to confirm appointments and be to transfer any other police and so on. And it goes on to spell out the functions of the commissioner of police of Trinidad and Tobago. And recently, we were told that um, the Prime Minister he went to a political platform, I think somewhere down in Sipari, and he um, announced that he, after being advised by the US authorities that he wanted to see the creation of special vetted police units within the police service of Trinidad and Tobago. And this was immediately met by what we would term widespread or outright rejection by the officer, the association which represents all police officers at the level of the second division of the police service of Trinidad and Tobago, the Trinidad and Tobago Police so Service Social and Welfare Association, led by one Mr. Gideon Dixon. In a Newsday article, it came out very clear that cops know to vetted unit leave us out of the political. That was the headline. But you see, Trinidad and Tobago, we must continue to put the Prime Minister and his actions under scrutiny and under the microscope. Because, you see, if the Prime Minister, he was part of the administration, or part of the government, although he, put a, he was relegated on the backbench and so on, under the um, government of Prime Minister Patrick Manning. If he had any sense to understand the history of that government and so on, he would have known that when the Special Anti-Crime Unit of Trinidad and Tobago sort was created, the big question marks about this unit was whether it was a legal unit. And in addition to that, who should that unit report to at that point in time? whether it was the Minister of National Security or the Police Commissioner. And Rowley seems to have learned absolutely nothing in terms of his political experience when he was part of that government and in the last eight years, absolutely nothing. And his announcement into the creation of an elite unit of high integrity officers as he quoted it to be, is highly suspicious and I will outline why it is highly suspicious because while the Prime Minister said that this suggestion came from the US authorities so that they can engage in information exchange and so on what it also means is after eight years of the government of Prime Minister Dr. Rowley apparently the US authorities do not know who to trust within our national security apparatus and within the police service of Trinidad and Tobago because they did not recommend more resources or more training and so on. The U.S. didn't recommend more laws or legislation, but they said they wanted more integrity. And as I said, after eight years of Dr. Rowley, and we must never forget you had former ministers in retired Brigadier General uh, Edmund Dillon and uh, 
this current Minister of Energy and uh, Energy Affairs, Stuart Young, and so on, the U.S. authorities is, are saying that they do not know who to trust. The issue is who to trust. And we must remember, this is a Prime Minister who has interfered with the leadership of the police service, contrary to the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago, on numerous occasions. And yes, for the records, and yes, for you to refresh your memories this morning. It was Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley who caused the merit list to be withdrawn somewhere between uh, the Prime Minister's office and the office of the President. He made the journey and he also intercepted this list. He hijacked the list. He brought the office of the President into disrepute. It was the Prime Minister's actions which caused the merit list to be withdrawn and also cause the systematic resignation of members of the Police Service Commission and a collapse of the Police Service Commission. We must never forget these things in terms of the actions of Prime Minister Rowley. It was Prime Minister Rowley who in an action which is very uncharacteristic of a sitting Prime Minister, he wrote to the Chairman of the Police Service Commission, the then chairperson, to complain about the sitting Commissioner of Police at that time, Captain Gary Griffith. It was the Prime Minister who instituted or initiated a two-man investigative committee of, I think, to us, the retired Justice Stanley John and some other retiree, contrary Contrary to the laws, we do not know what under what remit, under what legal remit these two individuals operated only to have the courts of the country rule against the Prime Minister, determining that because that the investigation was flawed, the report from the investigation could not have been laid in the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. We must never forget within the national security apparatus of this country, it was under this government, under this prime minister, that a CARICOM plane was commandeered within the regional security system, was mysteriously requested for the unauthorized reason of bringing back a national to Trinidad and Tobago from Barbados by the name of one Mr. Brent Thomas. In fact, a high court judge said it was a kidnapping. If I can recollect clearly the ruling, the language bordered on the fact that Brent Thomas was kidnapped. Was it the Prime Minister as the head of the National Security Council who requested this uh, commandeering of, of this plane? It was under the PNM government that the two police officers who investigated and so on this matter in the conduct of the PCA was who was supposed to, to be investigating police conduct from the PCA. They were sent on this extraction or kidnapping mission. Why and was it the Prime Minister within the national framework of national security who made these arrangements? So when you see that it was revealed that it did not follow the established protocols and so on. And uh, as I said, the UNC is concerned about the behavioral pattern, the action, the alleged actions and so on. Was it the Prime Minister that instructed that Mr. Brento must be brought back to Trinidad and Tobago in this clandestine manner? So you see the behavior of the Prime Minister forces the UNC here this morning to ask, is it, is it telling that the Prime Minister, in light of these actions, it is indeed telling that the Prime Minister announces a ten intention to create a supposedly new high integrity unit in the same week. I want to re remind you, in the same week as when we see police officers invading the homes of the Chief Secretary in Tobago, and persons 
or homes of persons who are opposed or diametrically opposed to the People's National Movement in Tobago. In light of the above, the Prime Minister must tell us who this elite unit will report to. Will it report to him as the Prime Minister? Will it report to Fitzgerald Hines as the Minister of National Security or both of them? And will they bypass the Commissioner of Police and exclude the Commissioner of Police because the Prime Minister and the Minister of National Security in keeping with the Constitution of this country they have no role no unit should be under the uh, reporting or responsibility of the Prime Minister and the Minister of National Security we call upon the Prime Minister to tell us what are the administrative and operational details of this unit? Don't go down Siparia in your desperation to try and convince the population that you are doing something about crime on a political hostel. My colleague told you everybody reeling from crime. Up to last night in the constituency of Kuva South, they hijacked a family, they invaded the home. They robbed them of their newly purchased motor vehicle. A high court judge, we, we read recently, her home was invaded. Luckily, she was not at home at the time, but the persons on the compound were robbed. Her home was violated. A pensioner, a 75 year old pensioner, was beaten in the constituency of Kuva South. Um, blood and virtually blunt trauma force to her midsection, her back ahead she died of her injuries every old age pensioner in this country their old age pensions are no longer safe because criminals are on the rampage and the prime minister they cannot bring crime under control after eight years so the Gondong Siparia to say we want a special unit now breaking the law undermining the constitution and the rule of law and then they're going to tell you what, in the context of local government campaigning, that um, uh, in addition to that, we will create or we are filling uh, 1,400, the vacancies of 1,400 municipal police officers. Hogwash, they dismantle, they, they did away with the comfort, citizen comfort uh, community patrols which was an initiative under the partnership government led by Mrs. Fasad Bissas. And you know what? In Kuva Tabaki Talpara Regional, if you ask them, up till today, only in eight, eight years, they have recruited 10 police, municipal police officers. Check the records. So when they come to tell you they're done and they're hiring and so on, it is hogwash in the context of local government campaigning in Kuva Tabaki Talpara they don't have even accommodation they don't have a proper dormitory they don't have proper proper facilities accommodation for male and female officers so again we want to know what are the the operational and ad, ad, administrative details as it relates to this special elite unit how much officers will you need? What will be the organizational structure? As I said, who will apply? Will all be invited from within the police service of Trinidad and Tobago? What will be the criteria to become a member of this elite unit? And of course, we all know, based on experience, with the extra pay that was given to officers of the special anti-crime unit, so on. It led to low uh, morale, self-esteem, divisiveness, and so on. Why would the Prime Minister not understand the implications of industrial relations issues that will be arise? Why not the Prime Minister show respect to the, the Police Service Social and Welfare Association? It is continued disrespect by the Prime Minister for recognized majority unions 
and the labor laws of Trinidad and Tobago and we will have none of it and we are saying that there are independent institutions in the context of vetting before you apply to become a member of the police service of this country and any law enforcement and any job when you apply you are supposed to be and you make the short list and you are about to be recruited you have the special branch to do vetting if you are indeed uh, suspicious of being involved in uh, illegal or as we would say uh, corrupt activities and so on there is the um, professional standards bureau there is the anti-corruption bureau and in addition to that if members of the public are highly suspicious of the behavioral pattern of police officers and so on they have the right to go to the police complaints authority and in addition to that if you need to acquire intelligence on officers and so on there's also this uh, strategic services services agency you could go to the courts you within the legal framework you could get intelligence you could get court orders and so on and is the prime minister telling the country that these institutions are not functioning or, they, or is he seeking to to compromise or yet lost faith in all these independent institutions which are supposed to deal with the whole question of conduct and integrity and so on of police officers of Trinidad and Tobago. So I will now move on to the, ver the second issue because you see this is the continuing trend in this country. Break the law, undermine the rule of law, undermine the constitution of this country. And you know what? You will be rewarded you will be rewarded with a prestigious job and i say that in the context of the appointment of mr darrell smith a former cabinet minister who has been appointed as a trade facilitation officer by his former colleague the minister of trade paula gopi schoon and while she she Minister Paula Bobby Schoon should have been ashamed as a woman to facilitate or probably carry the note to cabinet to facilitate this appointment. And this appointment of Daryl Smith, see the picture here, is surrounded by Minister Bobby Schoon and a number of other persons who too have been appointed. This appointment is a slap in the face for all women of this country, all the victims of sexual harassment in the workplace, in and outside of the workplace, and it is sending a very dangerous signal to all men in this country. You could violate women, you could abuse them in the workplace and so on. Prime Minister Rowley must take the blame because he is the Prime Minister his cabinet would have appointed, sanctioned the appointment. And what he's saying, men continue to abuse, continue to violate women, and you will be rewarded. Because this morning, I have to ask a question, because this is the same man, Darrell Smith, who was removed as a minister by this government for allegation of sexual misconduct. The allegations surrounded the use of taxpayers' dollars to pay the alleged victim $150,000 of taxpayers' money to stay quiet. They said that it was um, a confidentiality agreement that was uh, uh, made and so on. And uh, we must remember and I have to remind this country here this morning that it was when the allegations surfaced and so on and the payment emerged, the Prime Minister, Dr. Rowley, quickly in attempting to do damage control and so on, appointed a three-person committee. Jackie Wilson retired 
Governance Secretary. Attorney at law Elaine Green and uh, social activist Fulani Matuta. And uh, when the report was compiled and hearings and they concluded their report, the report was damning. The report pointed in a, a particular direction and further in uh, their quest to undermine the truth and hide the revelation and the damning contents of that report. You know what they did? They said that the report had to be re um, reviewed by the Office of the Attorney General at that time, one gentleman by the name of Faris al rawi And one of the person who was part of that three-person report, Fulade Motota, she described the, PN, the Prime Minister's withholding of the Smith report as shameful, shameful, reprehensible, and misogynistic. Those were the words. And uh, today, the Prime Minister may attempt to tell you differently that he, on the 17th of June 2018, he said that I fired Daryl Smith for interfering improperly in the public service. Why would the Prime Minister, I ask the question here this morning on behalf of the UNC, why would the Prime Minister put someone who interfered improperly with the public service to represent the country in an international post? What experience does Daryl Smith have in trade facilitation? We want to know what are the terms and conditions of Mr. Smith's engagement? We want to know the entire compensation package because Daryl Smith is not being paid from a private account. It, it, he is being paid from the taxpayers. He's being paid from the treasury of Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, today we condemn the Prime Minister, we condemn the Cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago for making and facilitating this appointment, which as I said, is an insult to all right-thinking women in this country, young girls, the victims of sexual harassment in and out of the workplace in this country. It is shameful. It is a dastardly act on behalf of this government. It shows there is no respect for the woman, the single mother, the, the woman who gave their blood, sweat, and tears for Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, it is telling men of this country continue to harass, continue to violate. And uh, if you are part and parcel of the, the, the inner sanctum, and you are part and parcel of the PNM, we will protect you, we will promote you when you do these acts in, in, in terms of re reprehensible behavior as it relates to the women folk in our society. And I now want to turn to another issue which continues to worry or be of deep concern to the United National Congress. And that is the Commission of Inquiry as it relates to Paria. It is an established fact that the PNM of Dr. Rowley did not want to have a thorough investigation into this particular uh, tragedy of national uh, uh, unprecedented and unparalleled uh, proportion in the context of our nation, our oil industry, and so on. And in addition to that, we must never forget that initially it was the UNC who had to call out the government when they um, did not want, when they appointed uh, one Eugene Tia who 
uh, we call him out and a conflict of interest because he um, was a client of the Minister of Energy and Energy Affairs and so on, Skiot Kyung. We must remember the, the harsh, the oppressive, the inhumane, the insensitive, the callous manner they treated the families when this incident occurred. They had them out in the rain, not even my chair, not even my bench, not even a tent, not even a, 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 a cup of coffee, a pack of, uh, of crooks, not even a bottle of water in terms of how they treated these families and so on. And uh, up till today, we have not been told uh, King's Council, Jerome Lynch, the chairman of the commission, has said to, to the country, due to unforeseen circumstances and so on, he has not been able to compile his final report. But in today's Express, there is a very troublesome article written by Miss Anna Ramdas, and the headline of that is $15 million bill and counting. And I would just want to read from that article, and I quote, Close to $15 million has been so, has so far been spent by the office of the Prime Minister on the commission of inquiry into the tragic deaths of four divers who had undertaken work for Paria Fuel Trading Company. And more taxpayer money may have to be forked out in litigation costs as there is a threat of legal action over the OPM's failure to provide a detailed breakdown of all the beneficiaries of the expenses. The OPM, and I want you to, to, to listen very carefully, the OPM has said it is unable to reveal people's information because of the high crime rate as these people can be targeted by criminals. So Rowley and Kier, if the pensioner or all pensioners are killed and violated for their three thousand five hundred dollars and the NIS pension to on a monthly basis, he ain't care if the ordinary people are hijacked, they are raped in their homes, carjacking, murders throughout the length and breadth of this country. But he is concerned because the office of the this is from the office of the prime minister, so he has to take the blame. I have to point my question in his direction. The OPM has said it is unable to reveal people's information because of the high crime rate, as these people can be targeted by criminals. And uh, it gives a breakdown in terms of the OPM stated that a total of 14 million five hundred and thirty eight thousand five hundred and eleven dollars and forty cents in bills have been so far uh, have so far been accumulated for the commission of inquiry and it gives a breakdown of how much was paid to Jerome Lynn senior counsel Ramesh Lawrence Maraj and junior counsel but most interestingly this figure does not represent money spent by Paria for the commission and uh, their retaining of Gilbert Peterson, senior counsel to defend the state enterprise and other expenses. So you can tell the country how much was paid to Jerome Lynch, King's counsel. You can tell the country how much was paid to Ramesh Lawrence Marad, senior counsel and junior counsel. But why you do not want the country to know how much was paid to senior counsel Gilbert Peterson. This is the same fella who was acting on behalf of Paria and did not want the families to testify before the commission of inquiry. And while millions of dollars have been spent to date on this commission of inquiry, we must never forget, Trinidad and Tobago must never forget that when lone survivor Christopher Budram applied or sought legal help from the Commission of Inquiry or from the state and so on, you know what Christopher Budram was told? Christopher Budram was told, go to legal aid. 
but Gilbert Peterson, who name I think, I don't know, calling in Tobago too, in whatever unfolding in Tobago, and uh, Gilbert Peterson spouse is a high court judge and so on, the office of the prime minister don't want, apparently, do not want the country to be told how much has been paid to um, him and that is passing strange and I further want to recollect the OPM permanent secretary Morris Reed provided partial information with respect to the expenditure following a freedom of information request dated the 14th of April 2024 from attorney uh, Vishal Silsaran of um, former Attorney General Anand Ram Logan's Freedom Law Chambers on behalf of social and political activist Marsha Walker. And uh, after seeking a one month extension on the 22nd of June 2023, the PS provided some information but not a detailed breakdown stating that pursuant to Section 31 of the Act, personal information is exempt from um, is exempt from release and as I said that again tells us why are they seeking you can tell everybody why are they seeking to protect and who is being protected and we will continue to prosecute this to find for the full and final payment or the cost to the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago, we will not allow this to simply rest. And on behalf of the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago, we are saying to the Prime Minister and uh, the Permanent Secretary, Morris Sweet, that these monies are being paid for, the bill is being expended on behalf of the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago, and we demand full accountability down to the final cent in terms of how much money the, the um, Commission of Inquiry, of course the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago, and uh, there must be no cover-up, there must be full accountability and transparency in the affairs of Trinidad and Tobago, and uh, the lawbreakers, the underminers of the rule of law, and the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago, Mrs. Passard Bissessa, and the United National Congress will continue to ensure that we call them out in our quest to ensure that there is full accountability, transparency, and good governance in the affairs of Trinidad and Tobago. We thank you and we remain at your disposal, members of the media, if you want to pose questions to us here this morning. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> um, good morning. My name is Rhonda Dowlett. I'm from the Guardian Media. Um, we just wanted to get a little clarity on Mr. Jack Warner coming back. Um, was this um, a meeting long in the works or who approached who, who sanctioned, you know, that return long before the date for the local government election the leader of the united national congress the honorable kamla Prasad recessor issued a call for all persons all political parties to unite to join together to get rid of the pnm because of the pain and the abuse that has taken place and tyranny that we are seeing from the pnm government a number of political parties responded a number of smaller political parties are also joining and with the naming of the date for the local government elections, several of those political parties came forward to support um, and to join together and form an accommodation which is, includes um, them having candidates on their own tickets, candidates on UNC tickets, candidates who, um, who are supported by the structures within those political parties. So at this time, we have candidates from the 
uh, NTA, the ILP, and other political entities working together um, in every region across the country. We expect that that unity that we are seeing on the platform is also happening on the ground, and it has been well received thus far. We have seen the political leader of the NTA, Mr. Gary Griffith, walking in several areas with UNC and NTA candidates, Mr. Warner, in the area where he has been um, living for many years, the Lopino Born and West constituency, also offered the UNC candidates. And so you will have collaboration with the political parties in terms of campaigning, in terms of uh, strategy and so on, as well as, um, as their candidates. So it is in keeping with that accommodation that you will see Mr. Warner, Mr. Griffith and others on the political platform, persons who would have uh, formed uh, Gavin Nicholas as well, sorry. People, the Gavin Nicholas of the DNA, Gary Griffith of the NTA, and Jack Warner of the ILP, um, and a number of other persons from smaller political parties have joined together in an accommodation. And the, uh, the idea is to unite to fight together. Yeah? <coughs> Um, was Mr. Warner part of that strategy meeting recently or what? No, this decision to have an accommodation would have taken place at the time when candidates were being considered and so on. So all of those political parties would have had discussions um, and the result that you are seeing in terms of who is on the platform now is as a result of that accommodation which would have taken place closer to the um, the time we're screening candidates and we're having discussions and stuff. Yeah? So we have a big meeting at the Center of Excellence on Monday where it is a joint platform. You will see the leaders of the NTA, Gary Griffith, the leader of the ILP, Jack Warner, and the leader of the UNC, the Honorable Kamala Prasad Professor, at the Center of Excellence. Um, that meeting is to announce or to present again the candidates from the Tunapuna region. And in Tunapuna region, there are 16 candidates, four on NTA tickets and 12 on UNC tickets. And that is another region where you have that collaboration as we do have in uh, numerous other um, regions, yeah? Is this collaboration a preview as to what we may see uh, for the general election? The leader of the UNC, the Honorable Kamala Prasad Bissessa, has constant, consistently been calling on persons to unite and to join. If we remain divided, the PNM will continue to rule with a minority. The PNM has been getting less votes in terms of the total number of votes that are cast. They get a minority and they end up in charge. In local election, when you look at the map, you see the number of regional corporations won by the PNM colored red. And it is a clearly a minority in terms of the, the re reflecting the population's will. In the general election, the PNM also won by a minority of votes because they did not get half or more than half of the population's votes, the individual votes. And it is an opportunity for all of us who are involved in politics, who have any interest in politics, but beyond the politics, who has an interest in Trinidad and Tobago, to put country before self. There are those who continue to attack the UNC or continue to attack other political um, players in the accommodation because they of their own personal issues. And you know, we have to think about the next generation. We have to think about whether we want Trinidad and Tobago to continue going down the path it is going under the PNM when the voice of the people in terms of the vote says that they are not all happy with the PNM. So this is an opportunity, another opportunity for all persons to uh, embrace that call for unity as we go into this local government election. This is a stepping stone towards the general election. And so it is an opportunity for all political parties to decide whether we want to continue on our own path or if we want to get rid of the PNM and put Trinidad and Tobago back on a path to good governance. What assurance can you give to members of the public in terms of this collaborative effort? I mean, in the past, you know, there were suspicions of a fallout uh, with the different political leaders and, you know, certain allegations. But what assurance can you give at this time? 
Well, I can tell you that Kamla Prasad Bisesa, as the leader of our People's Partnership in 2010, which was agreed on the Faisabad Accord, held together our government with five major political parties and five very strong political parties that lasted the entire term. And every one of the signatories to the Faisabad Accord remained with that government for its entire term. Uh, we had a, an accommodation, a partnership with the COP, the UMC, the COP, the NJAC, you had the, um, the MSJ and so on, and you had, you, so we saw that unity and people coming together for a purpose, and we saw that wave of support that came in the general election. So working together, forming a partnership, and working together is always a dynamic thing. But the bottom line is there must be unity, and the people, the electorate responded positively to that coming together in 2010, that partnership, that unity, um, holding together that partnership, I am certain would not have been an easy task for Mrs. Passard Bissessa, but as a firm, strong leader, she was able to do that. And therefore, uh, the, the country could just look at the record of partnerships and what, how partnerships bring better results, how partnerships bring more people involved, get more people in to involved in governance. And so it is, uh, I think the record is there to look at the facts. It is not for me to come and give you an excuse or a reason to uh, and try to um, convince you. I want to suggest that if you look at the facts, you know, any, any citizen will be convinced that it is always better to stand united. Mm -hmm. um, the, the issue, the state of the country demands this, uh, in the context of uh, crime, the, the record number of murders, home invasion, um, uh, unemployment, the state of the health sector, the state of uh, infrastructure, the state of the economy, the lack of foreign direct investment, the corruption, the nepotism and so on. Uh, the, the country is totally fed up with the state of affairs and uh, the UNC has always embraced the unity of all and uh, we will continue to ensure that that is uh, the common purpose in removing this reckless, lawless government which is uh, intimidating and uh, kind of a reign of terror on law-abiding citizens in this country. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just one more question for me. Um, with respect to the local government reform and the property tax um, proposal, what is the the opposition's um, come back to that or, you know, how, they, uh, how, how does the opposition plan to approach John Public? A lot, of, a lot of people out there not quite sure how this is going to work. Yeah. Um, the UMC is really asking the population to open your eyes. The PNM has been depriving regional corporations of funding for the past six or eight years. And I really feel that what they have been doing is sabotaging the regional corporations to prove to the country that we need property tax. They have been holding corporations hostage, holding citizens hostage, so that the state of neglect in terms of land slips, potholes, and, and management of the regional corporations to the extent where they don't even have fuel to put into their vehicles to do work. All of these, to me, point to the PNM withholding resources as a way of undermining the corporations to say that we need property tax. The, the UNC's position is very, very clear. We do not, we are against property tax at this time. We are firmly against property tax. The UNC was able to, die, to build schools, to build hospitals, roads, to create over 50,000 new jobs um, without a single new tax. We believe in diversifying the economy. And so our UNC's economic recovery plan is very important to us, even as we engage in local government. Um, because in coming into government, we must diversify the economy and properly manage the resources of the country. What we have seen is the PNM is wasting the money. We have seen them not being very transparent. We have seen big millions of dollars going to friends, family, and financiers while the population continues to suffer. The property tax will also widen the gap 
uh, between the poorer regions or, and the regions with property of higher value. Let me remind you that in property tax, the only residential tax go to the regional corporation. Commercial, industrial, and agricultural taxes, uh, properties taxes will go to uh, central government. So it is a lie to say that all property tax goes to the regional corporations to fix your roads. It is a mama guy that the, that the Prime Minister has been using that is totally incorrect. You will have now the bigger corporations, um, of course, having greater income from residential properties, while the smaller the population with smaller um, residential population or in fact those with higher density a larger number of residential properties especially those with middle income homes and so on of higher property will of course collect more taxes while regions in the rural areas for instance where you have houses much further apart you have a smaller density you have lower valued properties in many of those rural areas you have Sandy Grande region being named the poorest um, in terms of lowest income per capita in the country by CSO and those regions will be at a severe disadvantage when it comes to the collection of property tax. So under the, um, the PNM, what is the regime that is being promised is not only not practical, it is also not fair. So we are asking that property tax should not be implemented at this time. We are also calling out the Prime Minister to stop holding the population by our neck to try to force us to accept property tax. Yeah? That's it for me. Thank you. We also have the question of the resources that were allocated to do the things that regional corporations are supposed to do, um, in particular the special purpose secondary roads company that was formed, um, was given money in the budget, 100 million um, in, one, in one, in at the third initially, they were given 100 million even before that company was registered. We have not seen a single road being paved under that special purpose company. It moved from the Ministry of Local Government to the Ministry of Works under Rohan Sinan. And Rohan Sinan must have come faith. For clearly, Faris Alwari have failed to pave a single secondary road under that special purpose company. And we are questioning now, when will the paving of roads begin? Are you using monies from that fund to pave roads for election now that you are seeing the challenges? The PNM has, has, has seen themselves losing ground in San Grande, in Tunapuna region, in San Fernando and other areas. And we are seeing a rush to pave roads. The question is, Faris Alwari failed to pave any secondary roads under that special purpose company. Will Rohan Sinanan deliver and will it be done in a fair manner? Or did they put this special purpose company with millions of dollars under Rohan Sinanan to be used for political purposes in this local government elections? I believe Rohan Sinanan is a deputy political leader of the People's National Movement. He has been involved in their campaign. Tell us, is Rohan Sinanan using taxpayers' dollars to pay special purpose, to pay secondary roads under that special purpose company with the consent of the PNM government? Yeah? Those are all the questions. Huh? Those are all the questions. Okay. Yeah? Well, thank you very much um, for, uh, to members of the media for being part of this coverage this morning, this press conference, and also to members of the public who have looked on. And um, we take the opportunity to remind you to join us tomorrow evening at the Center of Excellence, 7 p.m., where you will be seeing a joint uh, meeting of a uh, platform of a unity uh, component on here where it will see the political leader of the UNC, the Honorable Kamala Prasad Bisesa, the political leader of the National Transformation Alliance, Captain Gary Griffith, and uh, Mr. Jack Warner, and others, as we present the uh, candidates of the Tunapuna Piapo Regional Corporation geography in relation to the ongoing local government elections campaign. Thank yeah. you very much. Meanwhile, stand your ground. Yeah.
Ah, ça marche, je peux